All right, I got with me and a very special, uh, very special guest who's joining me again, Matt Boudreau. Matt, before I, you know, I want to, I want to introduce you correctly, but I want you to just introduce yourself and share more about some of the awesome work you're doing before we get to I uh, lost in the weeds here on an awesome conversation. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate you uh, as always. So super high level, man. Um, been in the education game for a couple of decades, and I kind of went backwards, went in a very weird, weird direction. But Stanford first. Um, worked there for quite a while as a public school teacher, public school administrator in California, private school teacher, private school administrator, um, left all of that to really start two businesses simultaneously. One were um, schools, I don't even like using the word school, but education centers of my own connected to the Acton Academy Network that I really wanted my kids to go to. Um, and then simultaneously started speaking and consulting with some of the biggest organizations in the country so that I could hear from them, what are they not seeing from these you know, college grads that are supposed to be really smart, but um, they're going, why do we want to fire all of them? And uh, so I got to hear the ins and outs there and try to help them and bring that, you know, back to um, what we were doing on the school side. Um, more recently, uh, Tim Kennedy and I, his dear friend and business partner started uh, Apogee Strong, started out as just mentorship programs uh, for young men, moved on to men and women. Um, but we have partnered with a number of people around the world and we we're bringing uh, about 50 to 55 K through 12 young men, young women's uh, campuses uh, to the US, Canada, and Australia for 2024. So never heard for something to do. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Well, I'm I'm glad to have you on here today. And there's there's a a broader topic that I want to talk about today. I'm gonna I'm gonna set it up through the lens of there's a recent article, uh, not even worth referencing the specific article, but is there's a point buried in it that it it got me fired up when I read it. And I know that this is something that you will you will have a lot of thoughts on um, because I think that I think the opinion is a little bit oblivious to the quality and caliber of young adult that actually exists out there. Mm. And I think that the opinion embedded in this is used to a standard that we hold for our young adults mm. that is wildly low. And so I'm going to read, I'm going to read, I'm going to read this. There's a couple excerpts here, but I want to read one. And um, the article is basically about like the conversation about is college worth it or not. It doesn't mean much unless you're talking about, you know, what teenagers are going to do instead. And here's the excerpt it says there's an important question of whether people actually want to start their working lives at, that young. How many 18 year olds actually want to live at home with mom and dad and then go to work in some nondescript office setting for the next 40 plus years out of a desire to maximize lifetime earnings if the college track is at all available to them? Who doesn't want to spend a few years finding themselves drinking, drugging, sleeping around before they get serious about work? That's the, that's the human standard right there, huh? That's the standard. That's the human standard right there. What a poor view of humanity and our factory settings, right? Like that is, that's unfortunate. That's one of those, you know, you and I were talking prior to, uh, to jumping in here and we we're talking about some of the issues going on. And we said, look, there's a multifaceted cultural attack that's taking place. There's a number of, of, uh, of things that we are battling against from, um, you know, the fatherless homes to um, the societal narrative that you have to pick a side on any topic or the, in, in, you know, uh, that, somebody is screaming from the rooftops right now, you got to pick your side and, and go ahead and demonize the others um, as quickly and as loudly as humanly possible. We've got all these things that we are fighting against. One of those narratives that we are fighting against and have been for a long time is that young people are incapable and that they are going through, you know, these, these life stages where they're basically going to act like a jackass and that's what we should go ahead and encourage. And then everything. I, I hate that narrative. Um, and I've seen such the opposite. You know, I always talk about how the word teenager wasn't even around until 1944. That wasn't even a thing. Right? It wasn't even a thing. It was just like, okay, cool. You're 13. Great. So you're a man. <laughs> yep. Act like it. Um, the DNA hasn't changed in these last 80 years. Our expectations are what has changed. Um, you know, in, in all the work that we are doing working with families. And I said, we're building schools, but I work with families. I work with hundreds and hundreds of men in our mentorship program. I work with that. I've worked with thousands of parents, men and women at our campuses. And I've worked with all these young people. 
what we have found over and over again is that the earlier we get to have these young people on our campuses, the closer we are to being able to just maintain factory settings. And what I call factory settings is these, these young people want to take on responsibility, like at a massive freaking level. They want it early. They want to create. They want to work. They want to die. Like they want the opportunity to struggle, to fail, to build resilience. And the more we work with them, we're trying to keep them at factory settings. The more we're working with these parents who are further and further away, I'm trying to regain those factory settings for yeah. them. Right. And we're seeing this over and over. I see it with my own kids. Um, and it's truly unfortunate that so many people have bought into to that narrative. You know, the well, the brain, this is one of the things that gets me. The brain's not fully developed until they're 25, you know. <laughs> okay, cool. Big freaking like cool, man. Sounds good. But why don't you talk about the brain jump that happens at you know around eight or the one that happens around 12 or the one that happens around 16? There's a lot of these jumps that take place, but none of those preclude you from being able to be wildly and personally responsible. And it's really funny that you brought because I didn't know you were going to tee up that exact thing. Then it's really funny that you brought that up after um, you know, somebody just had just text messaged me about. Hey, did you really, were you really dropping, you know, that video you posted yesterday, were you really dropping your 12 year old off at work? And I'm like, yep, <laughs> she really worked that much. Yeah. She works about 40 hours a week. Yep. My 12 year old works That's about awesome. 40 hours a week and she loves it. And she would do more if we let her. So yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry for the long rant. No, you're good. You're good. Garbage. I, garbage. I mean, that, that point in it alone is 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 part of the problem in society. I think people people love to you know you're probably going to have people come after you and say, well, oh my gosh, that's violating child labor laws. And like if you read back through the history of like why child labor laws were even implemented, mm -hmm. it's it's to keep children from competing for jobs. It's not it's not to keep kids from working. It's right. it's it's so it's it, we have such a a riddled history with like crazy things that have now become the norm. And there's a story about them that's that's it's perpetuated for yeah. reasons that are not true. And it's one of those being like kids are incapable, irresponsible. We should hold them to lower standards. And I think that that bleeds over. And I think back to my own I think back to my own experience coming out of high school and into college. And man, I look back and I'm like. I hate to say it, like I'm embarrassed by the way yeah. I spent my college time. I did a ton of stuff that was really good and sure. it looked good on paper and I got great work experience, but like I did not have an aim. You know, I went into college thinking I was going to do one thing. I got, I realized immediately, like I was just playing the status prestige game. And I was like, I've never really thought deeply about what I want to do. Nobody's yeah. ever challenged me that. And, you know, 18 years old, that scared me. And so I, I was one of the people that like today, you know, today, these, this lower standard, I was living to a lower standard and I knew I could play the game. And I knew that, that I had this, I had this, it's almost ridiculous that this is the way that it is, but I had this permission slip that it's like, as long as you are doing the things to look good on paper and you're being a good student, you're being like all this, like you can get away with anything. You yeah. can go act like a complete jackass. Yeah. And nobody's going to really be that upset with you as right. long as you're doing that. And so you can be a complete degenerate, but then like, you know, you're involved on campus and you're, you know, doing all these things and in these clubs and doing all that. And it's like, you can lead that dual life. And the, and the bad thing about that, especially for, this is why I get so fired up about what we're doing, because, you know, I was a high achieving kid that I fell down to that lower standard. Right. And when you take uh, an ambitious kid they don't have to be academically inclined but when you take an ambitious kid and you said hey you're off the hook nobody's going to expect anything um mm -hmm. of you morally of of you from like an actual responsibility level here's all you have to do to win the game at this level and then you do that and then you get out in the real world and that that bleeds over like it takes a while to recapture your bearings because you've been playing in this artificial world where that's not the way the world works like people suddenly up oh, you're 22, you get out in the real world. And now there's this new set of standards. It's just, it's such a harmful way to usher the disproportionate percentage of our young adults into the real world, because then it's this abrupt ending. And now they, they walk out into the real world for the first time where they're actually going to be held to real standards and they're entirely incapable of navigating it. 
You're ex you're exactly right. So think about the time you spend doing anything. You do anything for 12 years, 15 years, 16 years, or whatever. You get really, really good at it. So if you are spending the majority of your time holding this low standard, if you are spending the majority of the time holding a standard of, and not just the standard of like low character, but low workout. Yeah. I learned very quickly how to play the game with a low output. I could yeah. get A's with no effort, right? So now my habit is low effort and I should get everything that I'm told about. Like, <laughs> wait, life isn't going to reward that, right? Low effort, you still get your stuff, right? And no, it doesn't work. Like these are the habits that we're ingraining. And I was very, very fortunate. I love the way you frame that because I, I was very fortunate that at least um, growing up in school, same thing, low effort, got the A's. So it's like, cool, man, I'm developing those bad habits. I know how to obey really well, but I at least still had martial arts, mm -hmm. right? I at least still had a couple of jobs. And it was very interesting because those were the places that held a higher standard because, well, you're working at a at somebody else's business. They expect you to hold a higher standard. And I could meet the standard there, yep. right? So I wasn't incapable. I was just meeting whatever standards were presented to me in the various parts of my life. Yep. I go into the gym. I go into the martial arts gym. Like there's a very high standard of honor and integrity and you got to show up and you got to put in the work. So I would do it. I would rise to the standard that was there. It didn't change when I got into college. I figured out very early how to do very low work and still get my A's how to be a total jackass with how I was around, you know, the other low standard living people. Yep. But I was working three jobs, managing the apartment complex. I had to have a certain standard. Working for a bank, I had to have a different standard. Working at a bar, well, the standard's much lower again. So what do I do? I always met those standards, Yep. right? So- what that means is we we make normal what we make normal. If we make high standards in all areas that matter, the character, the honor, the integrity, the compassion, the politeness, the bravery, the, like we make the standards high there and then correlate the work ethic and all that stuff there, like they will rise to meet it. Yep. We will rise because that's what's normal. Absolutely. Absolutely. I you know, I have the good fortune like you, you know, you get to encounter so many awesome young adults. And I, I feel this from time to time, literally on a weekly basis, I'll be dealing with an uh, 18, 19 year old and, you know, I, I get to help them through their problems. And sometimes yeah. they feel like their problems are so big. And, you know, I know how it can feel at 18, like everything, mm -hmm. you know, you've got 18 years to reflect on. Everything is a big challenge relative to the amount of time and life experience you've had. You know, even if you've, um, you know, even if you've been raised in an environment where you were presented with opportunities to grow and develop, but I still, I get to work with some of these young adults and I get to hear about the things that they're, they're the challenges that they're facing. Mm -hmm. And I'm both embarrassed and envious because I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my God, you're, you need to calm down what you're, you're, you shouldn't be stressed at all. You are 10 years ahead of everybody. You're, and it's not about, you know, your position relative to others, but you are so far ahead and you're still so early in the game. Yeah. Your, your bar is going to be here for the rest of your life. And that excites yeah. me so much. It makes me so hopeful. But when I read things like this article and I see all of this, um, oh, I, I happened on Twitter the other day, I, I posted something about, you know, we shouldn't be asking kids you know, the questions that we should be asking kids, you know, when they're considering college is like, is this the best way for me to get a running start? And I had multiple people comment and engage and I posted this on a few different places. And, you know, it was like, are 18 year olds even capable of, you know, answering that question for themselves? And like, that's a really dim view. It's a really dim view that, that, you know, that we think that they're not. And two, that we've just made it a norm that we don't expect them to be capable of, of having those kind of like, you know, deep inner conversations with himself, because I guess sometimes I get in the echo chamber in my little bubble too, getting to deal with really high caliber, high quality people who I'm like, these kids blow me away. I wish that I was even half, half the man they were at 18. At that age, where would could. I be today? 
<laughs> me too, man. Me too. And what's sad, if we really want to look at it, so it's not, it has nothing to do with, it's not the age. Maturity is, is not relevant to age anymore. I know 12 year old men and I know 40 year old children. Because I know 40 year olds that are still asking them, oh, what do I want to be when I grow up? What do I want to do? Oh, everything is, oh, and they're, they're asking the same questions that I've worked with other young men who went through that at 12, 13, 14. And now they're, you know, they're on a path and they're figuring some things out. All right. So it, it has nothing, it has very little to do with the age of the individual. And again, it's a more multifaceted issue. How close are they to the factory settings and, and why? Who are the people they are around? What are the things that they are paying attention to? What are the things that they, you know, what are the distractions that they're intentionally avoiding? Like all of those things matter. Yep. Age is so far down the scale on making that kind of decision making matter. Yeah, I'll give you an example of this in in society recently. This is a couple of years ago, and this this upset me so much. Um, and it's it's a it's a stupid one, but mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, the federal government banned jewel pods, and you know it's all these well-meaning people like teenage teenagers shouldn't be getting addicted to to vape pens and tobacco, and there's maybe arguments that are that are good about you know marketing tactics and and the addictiveness and all that. I totally get that. Sure. I I I used tobacco as a teenager you know for for quite a few years as a baseball player like that's what you did you know and yeah, and, yeah. and i think back to all of the reasons why it was like this is this dangerous little corner of the world that i i can get away with you know mm -hmm. i'm in the school system i have basically no autonomy over how i live my life over like do i want to play this sport or this sport like there's expectations of me to conform and obey and like follow the rules and so like there's this one little corner that I like i can sneak and it's a little vice and like that was part of the addictiveness it wasn't yeah. nicotine it was like this danger of things and i remember getting so mad about this and i wrote this piece that i know upset some people a couple of years ago is i was like listen it has nothing to do with the good arguments you're making what it is is that because we've we've begun to hold 18 year olds to such a low standard teenagers to such a low standard and we've told them hey you're not old enough to make these kinds of decisions for yourself mm. that's what that's what provoke, provokes it it's it's i want to have some area that i ha i can be dangerous i want to have some adventure and it's that call that's why so many teenagers get you know they get hooked on bad things it's why they start doing things like acting out it's like they want some area of danger in their life. They want some adventure or journey. And I know that, you know, you get to act, interact with slightly younger demographic than me. And I, I just want, I want to get your take on like the things that you've seen too. Like some mm. of the, the strictures that we put in place as society that are not helping the way that they, you know, purport to be. That's right, man. I, I What you just said is so powerful. Understanding Look, that when I'm talking about the factory settings, you're laying part of these out. Part of the factory settings is we actually aren't overall that much. We're not really risk averse. We kind of want a little bit of danger. We want a little bit of excitement. We want an adventure, right? We talk about it from a male standpoint with our young men. It's like, you want that princess to rescue. Um, you want that adventure to go on. You want that dragon to fight. Like that's built in and you're going to find that no matter what. Right. So you're going to find it and you're going to develop that. What happens in um, and now, you know, grand people don't like when I make this uh, this correlation, but it is what it is. School and prison, very much the same, very similar structures. Right. So you got prison system. What happens? These guys are told what you know, when to wake up, when to go to bed, when they can take a shower, when it's time to eat, when it's set. like they're told all those things. So what happens? They go out on the yard, they find their click, their people, they can they can get in there and they try to figure out a way to exhibit and exert power over someone. They don't have a voice in their own life. But that innate desire to do something dangerous and do something like that's there, man. So they're going to figure out a way to do it. You're going to have the same thing that's mimicked in school. So they don't, there's no voice. There's no, like, you don't have autonomy over your day. You're told what to do, when to do it. You're like Pavlov's little freaking dog and bell rings and you move on to the next thing. So what happens? These people come out and now it's recess or it's lunch or whatever. Cool. Let's band together. Let's find my click versus your click. Let's go exhibit power because gosh, man, we have to have some danger. We have to have something we can control. We got to have a battle we can fight. And we don't really have any other outlets. So they find stupid battles and stupid things like we, you know, we find dumb ways to do it, which then just perpetuates the narrative for a lot of people because we're just not given choices. I'll tell you what we see is when we give these young people choices earlier, 
of battles to fight mm -hmm. that are actually big and hairy, but they're productive. Yep. Dude, they take them and then they band together to take on. I've got more 12 and 13 year olds that I've seen based on our campuses. They band together to go take on starting a business. Yep. They go band together to go make a pitch to a bunch of local entrepreneurs. They band together and compete in, in things that actually matter and build resilience. We're seeing the same thing with our young men. We, read, we don't remove we don't remove the desire to do what they want to do. We just change the constraints and we just focus uh, the effort in a different avenue, man. And they, they come right to it. You know, we, we challenged one of our, uh, we, ch we challenge all of our young men in the mentorship program. They take on the paperclip challenge of, you know, you got 30 days to flip a paperclip and see what you can get, you know, see what you, <laughs> see what you, see what you can do with that. Right. And the intentionality and the reflections upon that, you know, and we got a young man who within 30 days gets his first ever truck at 16. It's his first ever vehicle and he didn't spend a dime. He traded up from a paperclip. You think all the other young men aren't excited to get after it and see if they can beat him and outdo him. And they're yeah. like, they're taking on challenge and adventure. Right. So yeah, it's um, the expectations and the constraints because we're going to do what we're going to do. We're going to find that danger and adventure where are we going to find it? Yeah. That's the question. So you've, you've been in education for a long time. You said it at the beginning, but you've, you've not just been in the education game. You've been in a lot of different capacities. You've been in as you were a superintendent. I knew you were in a public school system. Yeah, it was a, uh, yeah, it was the public school. So it was uh, the first administration role that I took on. So yep. a lot of people don't know there's actually single school districts in California. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was by default, because I was the school administrator on site, it makes you superintendent of that of that district. But it's really was a site administrator yeah. principal. Yeah. So so you had a, a at least a pretty good pulse of like what was happening in the hallways. Yep. Hundred yeah. percent. How prevalent were things like bullying and fights and like just the normal like worst kind of things like that that you hear about public school? I mean. I mean, at least in the schools that I was at, it's pretty dang prevalent and I don't want it. So I want to make something super clear. Um, this didn't necessarily change. I was in some pretty rough areas um, of California, but it didn't change when I went to the really the higher socioeconomic areas too. It didn't yeah. change the drug problem. The only thing that changed on it was we went from weed to prescription meds, right? The, mm -hmm. uh, the, the fights were the fights. The um, if anything, when I went to the, the, higher socioeconomic, you know, areas. Um, we had the addition of maybe a little less bullying, but more like uh, sex in the bathrooms. So you're trading one issue for another. At some point, I remember saying like, man, I, I, like, I'd rather deal with more of these, like these guys like to fight all the time. And these two rival, <laughs> like, I like that more than having to be like calling these parents because they're kids, yeah. these kids you know, boys and girls and they're filming it. And it's like, man, that breaks my heart even more than the fights, you know, yeah. uh, sometimes. Right. So, um, no, it was prevalent. Yeah. So, so this is a little bit loaded setup because yes, you know, for all the haters out there, like, yeah, this is a small sample size this is in the entire United States. But I, I want to ask you, like, how do you feel like the relationship between any given student body you know, mm. among your work with Acton, among Apogee, like mm. students that are, you know, young adults that are treated as auton autonomous mm -hmm. young human beings. Mm -hmm. They have this higher standard of responsibility. Like, how does that change? Do you see the same prevalence of those types of issues? I'm guessing not, but like, I want to hear from your experience, like how those different sets of standards actually play out from your experience. It, um, it, the best thing I can tell you, because it, the easy answer is, dude, it's night and day. That's the yeah. easy, it's the honest answer. Um, but I want people to really grasp why the difference. And the best thing I can think of yeah. in, in the moment is I'm, I'm going back to what I said 
as we were talking about the the different standards, right, of how I of how I showed up even as a teenager. I'd show up at school and I'd be the model student for the teacher, but I'd be the total douchebag during the breaks, right? Who was like the yep. the dumb jock and chasing the girls and being the slime ball over here. And I regret, I, you know, of course I regret all that garbage, but I showed up as those different. And then I, when I'd go to work, I was the consummate professional. I I understood how to play whatever game it was that I was playing at that time. People do that anyways. Mitchell yep. as Mitchell as my friend is very much Mitchell. You are you. I know I know that you're authentic. You're very much you. But you and I will never have the same relationship as you have with your wife. Obviously. Yeah. That's also very much Mitchell. Right? There's nothing different. There's no pretense there. That's very so authentic and authentic, but those are two different relationships. By the way, both of those are different than Mitchell when he goes to work. And all three of those are different Mitchell as the father to a daughter, right? They're all very much you, but you go, you rise to a different occasion. You you pull out different pieces of you because the relationships are different. Well, our environments create the same thing for all of us. You're not the same guy when you're at a baseball game cheering on your favorite team as you are, you know, when you're standing in front of a judge because you had to go to court <laughs> or whatever, as you are when you are at work and, you know, your job is to serve these clients like it's always you but it's a different version right yep. the environment matters in creating who we are in that environment so when you've got a conveyor belt school environment i don't care if it's good part of town bad part of town private school public school pri the environment that structure begets a certain uh attitude and a certain, you know, uh, type of person that comes out of that. When you change, drastically change that environment that goes, Hey, we trust you. We believe in you. We're on your side. We want to stoke this curiosity. Um, we're going to put these, these things in front of you that you're actually excited about. You can't help it. It is human nature. The outcome is different. And when you've got that adventure to focus on, you're not worried about, the other you're not looking for like what is the dangerous no you're looking like man i've got something in front of cool man let's go get after it it's yeah. a human nature thing man yeah that's awesome so i want to i want to dig a little bit deeper into that because again like there's a lot of contrast and overlap in sort of what you do with apogee what you know we do at praxis but it's very much you know i kind of have this sliver of the journey for young adults it's it's mostly that like 17 to 22 and so a lot of times you know the best students i get to work with are the byproduct of like 17 years of parents being involved and like winning wow. the game right and and like setting their their young adults up for success and i don't always get to have you know the full scale visibility i i, I have you know i get to hear you know here's here's here are some of the things i did that contributed to who i've become at 17 but i don't get the full cycle journey and i want to hear because you very much have, you know, full visibility into that journey and have, you know, decades and decades of experience seeing, you know, start to finish journeys for young adults. Yep. Walk me through, you've got a, a young adult, 17 year old, who's like, they, they have championed the race. What are yeah. the things that go into that? Yeah, that's a really good question, man. And I love the way I love the way you frame. That's a really good question. Um, so the things that we have have seen, because we've tried to do that same thing where we kind of dissect this, right? We've tried to dissect this journey and go, okay, well, what are the patterns that we are seeing when you've got these 17 and 18 year olds that are absolutely crushing it? What are the similarities? What are the things that we can pretty much hold our hat on and go, cool, if we can impart this early on? Um, so the parents matter, but it matters in a very specific way. The parents matter in terms of the parents are leading by example. The parent is on a journey of growth. Uh, we hear parent involvement and a lot of parents will go, okay, so that means I show up to all the PTA meetings. It means I'm going to be the one <laughs> I'm sitting in the classroom. I'm going to make extra cookies. I'm going to make sure I've got like, I'm going to do, and I'm going to really watch and I'm going to tell the teacher every year what my kid needs and when he needs it, when I, right. And they become this obsessed overlord of the child's life. That's not parent involvement. That's a parent obsession that is just yep. as damaging, right? Yep. It's just as much putting the thumb on that young person. 
But when the parent has his or her, her own open journey of growth, I'm trying to get better at this. And they're open to having conversations with that young hero and bringing them along. Hey, I'm trying to get better at this. I want you to see what I'm doing. Here's where I screwed up. Here's where I'm doing well. Like when that parent is open, that is the number one indicator that I've got a young person that's going to be growth minded. Yep. Yep. By far, far and away. When the parent is also very intentional about they're leading by example, right? They're not going to be hypocritical. Um, they're going to be open about their successes and their failures. They're bringing their child along like that part's huge. But when they also are very intentional about, okay, next level down, who else does my young person get to be around and who yep. do they not get to be around? We have this weird thing where we call anybody that doesn't go to public school they must be sheltered, right? <laughs> that's the dumbest frick i always ask people they're like i'm like what do you mean by that well you know they gotta know that there's bad people out there somewhere you know and they're gonna have to learn to deal with it i'm like cool man so anytime you want to level up do you go to prison for a while and just hang out so that you are reminded that there's bad people no that's dumb as hell what you do is you surround yourself with people who are doing something better than you and you try to learn from them right we always say because it's true you're the product of the five people you spend the most time with right yes that matters, right? You got you want to be a real estate investor? Go hang around five real estate investors all the time. Like eventually you're gonna get some, you're gonna invest. Like you wanna be in shape, go hang around. If the top five people you hang out with are always in the gym, they're eating right, they're working like, dude, you will do that too. So the parents of these young heroes that are really crushing it are super intentional because they understand that for a long time they are the inner voice for that young person. But by the time that young person gets to be, you know, 12, 13, they automatically will start to look out there and, and the parents start to lose a little bit of influence. But those parents are very intentional going, oh, my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Let me introduce you to Uncle Mitchell. Right. <laughs> because he's, because I know he's another solid person to lay in there. Right. Um, one of the other things that we saw commonalities is they gave those young people responsibility early. That was one of the commonalities. These young people who are crushing it had chores that were theirs that started at an early age. Many of them also started working at a very young age. They had responsibilities that they were expected to take care of. And by the way, almost always, if they didn't take care of their responsibility, there was a correlation in a lot in a loss of freedom somewhere. Yeah. Right. So that standard was held. Yep. Meet your responsibility or you lose this freedom. Yep. The parents were also um, usually very intentional about minimizing distractions. And what I mean by that is usually nowadays, it's it's more around the technology side. I'm not saying tech's bad. I will never demonize it. You and I are getting to talk right now because we're having this tech, like the tech's a good thing, but they're very um, intentional about what tech can be used, when it can be used and what it is used for and not allowing the young heroes to go deep down the rabbit hole of, uh, you know, video games for five, six, seven hours a day, days on it, like cell phone usage and just, I'm just going to sit and scroll and just go do it. And they're very, very intentional about those things. Um, and then the fifth thing that we saw that was pretty universal in these kids. Um, and I'm, by the way, I'm actually saying all of these in order of what we saw, like this was the most yeah. important. Um, and the one thing that I think is just as important really is everything else, but it was kind of number five on our list just because of the prevalence of it, but is the physical health of the young person. Um, I think that's something we don't talk enough about. Um, we like to say mental health, uh, yeah. it's trendy, but <laughs> mental health sits on the foundation of physical health. All right. So if that young person's getting out, getting some sunshine, they're getting some exercise, they're eating real food, they're not eating prison food and garbage, you know, trash. Um, they're not being medicated with every new medication of the week. Um, those things matter. So those are kind of those are the top five. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I get to see a lot of those, I would say, from my own experience, like interviewing young adults, talking with them. And, you know, sometimes like it, it doesn't even take it doesn't even take 30 seconds sometimes on a, on a video call or even a phone call, like with young adult. And it's like, 
hey, I'm going to ask you about your experience and I could probably guess what, what experiences you've had. Like you, you've had work experience. What do your parents do? Like how involved were they? What are, tell me, like you can, you can almost do a rundown and um, you know, again, it's not to finger wag at parents that have done it wrong, but like, it's, it's, it's obvious from my experience that there are really strong commonalities between those things that you've said and like where, what trajectory those people take. And I don't mean academic, typical right. cookie cutter, like, right. Maybe some students still go to college and they they thrive, but they're probably better set up for success because of those things. They're taking, they're yeah. not making decisions because they're expected of them, and they're making them because they have agency over their lives, which is a that's wild, right. you know, wild. That's difference. exactly that's exactly it. And and look, what you said on the finger wag part too, like parents, you know, this isn't uh, this isn't condemnation. If you look back, and go, okay, well, cool. Well, I, this part I didn't get right, or I didn't. Cool, you're not dead. Today's a new day. Start now too, like. That's it, right? Like I'll I'll look back. There's plenty of things I look back with my three yeah. kids, and I'm like, oh, okay, I would have done that differently, right there. Cool. So I do it differently now, and I do it differently yeah. in the future. You know, so take control of whatever you can, can take control of. It's not a finger wag at all. We all there's no such thing as perfect parenting, but perfection can always remain the standard. You'll never hit it, but why not make it the standard? Yeah, yeah. The way we look no, at it. Uh, no, no doubt. And, you know, I'm, I'm a new parent, so I'm, I'm learning everything like, you know, on the fly yep. and my wife and I, you know, fortunately I'd say we've been very intentional. There were a lot of things that I would say uh, conversations we had about like, as our kids gets older someday, which we're so far about and, you know, like so many conversations about some of those bigger, bigger ticket items that it's like, you know, we started those conversations years ago even. Mm. And I've, I've told her, I was like, I just, we have to talk these out because I know if we wait to do these, like I'm going to do it wrong. And I need to like, start talking these things out. And I need to start talking and hearing about from other parents, because like, I don't want to get to the point where, you know, we've got an 11 year old, 15 year old, 17 year old kid. And now I'm suddenly in the moment, like trying to figure all these things out because it scares, it scares the hell out of me. Like, right. I know I'm not going to be ready for these things unless we, we, we'd be as intentional as we can to like begin to build some guardrails that are important and like talk about how we're going to pass those values along. And I just, you know, I think it's awesome that there are programs like Apogee and so many things coming out, like so much, so much attention on everything that comes before yes. the young adult leaves the house today, like this whole yeah. homeschooling and micro schooling and, and what I call it, what you will. It's like, people are now paying attention more than they ever have, which I think is a net positive. That's it, man. Oh, it's, it is. It's so good. Um, you know, uh, people I had somebody ask me, um, came over to the, he came out to the farm and it was the first time we'd seen each other in person. And he goes, well, and, okay. In video, I didn't real like, I didn't realize you're in good. You're in good shape. Like you're in, <laughs> I knew you were in good shape, but he's like, you get still have like a six, Growing up, like you're in good shape, dude. He's like, how, and how old are I? I'm like, well, I'm 40, 43, man. I'm like, thank you, I appreciate that. He's like, so okay, so what's the secret, man, for being in shape at 43? I'm like, the secret is I got in shape 25 years ago, and I <laughs> like that was it, right? Like I set the foundation a long time ago, and then I just stayed there. Likewise, people, well, why is your, you know, oh wait, just wait till your kids are teenagers, man, because like it gets super hard. It doesn't have to be super hard. Okay, well, how do you make it not hard for, for you know, having a relationship with a teenager? You have a good relationship with them when they're six months old and when they're a year old and when they're two years old and when they're three years old and when they're four. You're intentional that entire time. Yeah. How do you how do you traverse the teenage years? Well, it happens right from the beginning. Yeah. That's how you set a strong foundation. It's, it's exactly the same thing, man. So that's what all of this is, is again, when I'm saying like preserving those factory settings, if we can preserve those, so we don't fit, it's the Frederick Douglass concept, man, create strong children. So you don't fix broken men. And it's yep. because they've gotten so far away from that factory setting that, you know, our, our guidance for these parents and for these men, it's almost always addition by subtraction. Right. Where for the youngsters, we can keep it. It's a lot of times it's addition by addition, showing them like here's coaching, man, and a little bit of like 
good decisions and different things to point and put in front of them. Like here's a positive challenge here, a positive challenge here, a positive challenge here, pick one. Like it's addition by addition that the, a lot of times for these dads and for these moms, it's like, nope, you believe that. And that's not true. How do we strip that? And you believe that that's not true. How do we strip that? Right. It's, it's uh, addition by subtraction. So yeah, it's, it's, really. it's, it's funny. The more time that passes, I just, I become more and more convinced that like everything in life is just a function of compound interest. Mm -hmm. of like, mm -hmm. You don't, uh, positive decisions, beget positive decisions, negative That's decisions right. tend to beget negative decisions. But I, I did learn one thing in college and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of close this out here because we're, we're coming up on time. I'll close out with this one story. So I had a, had a professor who, I guess you could call him a professor. He spent most of his, his time out in the world. And he like kind of casually taught a class. And he was one of the first people that told me, he's like, don't go to law school, just go, go get involved in business. He's like, you don't need more school. But he, he taught this one class and he, he, he had this one lesson. I don't even remember what the class was, but he had this one lesson. And I remember it like it was yesterday. He's the, the headline of the lesson was, if you don't want to fall into the grand Canyon, don't go to Arizona. And he said, he said he was reflecting back to a conversation he had jokingly with a buddy when he was in his like early twenties, who was, his buddy was getting married. And he, uh, he, he said something like, Oh, well, I hope I never cheat on my wife. And his point, his point in the lesson was like the worst time to hope. He's like, if you don't want to cheat on your wife, don't wait until you're sitting in a hot tub with a bunch of other half naked women to, to feel like you're relying on your willpower. He's like, if you want the there, if you want certain results out of life, there are certain decisions that lead to it. And if there are things that you absolutely want to avoid, then there's a set of behaviors that you absolutely need to avoid. And he said those compound over time. And he's like, if you don't want the bad, avoid the the decisions that lead to it. And if you want all the good stuff to come out, like focus on the decisions that lead to those things. And I've thought about that for years and years, and I think it's just so applicable to everything about, you know, becoming a parent raising young adults to thrive in the real world. And like, also like your own continued development. So good, man. Um, we tend to, humans tend to complicate everything. We like to overcomplicate everything, you know, and, and one of my mentors in education, um, there's a gentleman named Larry Rosenstock and Larry uh, started the high tech high schools in, in California. One of the very few charters that I would get on board with um, just because of, of Larry and his leadership and what that looks like. And one of the things I remember him saying to me decades ago was um, he said, you know, if you create a complex structure around anything, humans will automatically default to simple thinking. He goes, if you want to see the beauty of a human mind, create a simple construct and then let the complexity of the human mind go out. And so I love that, man. And so one of our very simple um, foundational rules in our house, and this is a rule for all our whole family, you know, gets behind is be a copycat. And it is exactly what you just talked about there. If there is something that you want to do or somebody that you want to be, there's a roadmap for it. Find the people who have done that or who have been that ahead of you and just look for the patterns and like what, you know, you don't want to become them. That's impossible and stupid. That's not a good goal. But if they've done something you want to do, well, there's a pattern around that. And it's usually a pretty simple, it doesn't mean it's easy, but it's usually a pretty simple pattern. So follow that pattern. And if somebody is doing something that you don't want, becoming something you don't want, well, there's a pattern there too. So let's avoid that. And if we can keep that simple mindset, um, it'll allow us the headspace to allow the complexity of figuring out the solutions along those paths, you know, and, and I've, I've found that very much to be true. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, Matt, as always, it's been a pleasure today. Thanks for joining me. Pleasure is always my brother. Anything I can do anytime. All right. We'll talk again soon. Thanks for listening.